Thanks for tuning in to Crontendo episode 14, and this time we have not one, but two big new games from Nintendo. And we'll finally be done with 1986 and moving on to 1987. Let's start by taking a look at the last few games released at the end of December 1986. Episode 14's game is a real doozy, another FDS release. It's Hikari Shinwa, or Myth of Light, released in 1987 in the United States as Kid Icarus. FDS users could obviously save their games, though in the US version we had to make do with passwords. It was necessary to change some of the sound effects in the US version, probably most notably the noise that Pit makes when he gets hit. In the US version, he makes a horrifying animal-like squeal. The ending was changed slightly, but other Netflix games are virtually identical. Here we have the title screen that's more familiar to most US viewers. Kid Icarus, Angel Land Story. For those who don't recall their Greek mythology, Icarus was the son of Daedalus, and he flew too close to the sun and his wings melted. Kid Icarus borrows some characters and imagery from Greek mythology, but doesn't really have anything to do with the actual story of Icarus. Now, Kid Icarus looks very similar to Metroid in a lot of ways, and it actually borrows a lot of that earlier game's code. I suppose in current terminology, we would say that it uses Metroid's game engine. However, Kid Icarus differs from Metroid in many ways. First of all, the actual difficulty has been cranked up considerably. This is in many ways much harder than any of Nintendo's previous games. Notice for here the enemies sort of fall right out of the sky almost directly on you, and uh, pretty much come at you non-stop. Here for example is this uh, Grim Reaper character. He takes a lot of hits to kill. And if he happens to be facing your direction and sees you, he will send a flock of mini reapers to attack you. And, while all this is going on, uh, waves of regular enemies are coming to attack you at the same time. And this is actually only about one minute into the game. Notice the way the enemies sort of fly around you and suddenly dive bomb you at strange angles. And of course your character starts out with almost no health, and a weapon that can only shoot a few feet in front of him across the screen. I'm sure that the sheer difficulty of these early levels have undoubtedly dissuaded many gamers from getting very far into the game. Now just like Zelda, you collect money from fallen enemies, they actually look like hearts, and these can be spent on helpful items in these very Zelda-like shops. Most of the items have to do with healing. For example, the barrel enables you to carry more healing potions. Each of Kid Icarus's world has four levels, followed by a difficult and maze-like fortress. Occasionally, you will encounter these uh, sacred chambers in which Zeus will bestow uh, weapons, uh, power-ups upon you. Here, for example, is one right here. Collecting the arrow will increase your firepower uh, from what, level 1 to level 2, as we can see there under strength. You will occasionally get health bar increases at the end of the level. This actually has to do with how many points you've accumulated during the level. Once you reach a certain point, a number of points, you'll uh, get uh, another health bar. Here are the points are counted off. These are almost, in some sense, I suppose, like experience points. Though I didn't quite make it to the next level. And of course, Zeus will occasionally send you to these testing chambers, uh, where you have to fight off a large number of enemies here. If you survive this, you can get some special weapons. In this case, I'm going to choose that little magic wand-like thing, which will sort of send these little kind of uh, Gradius-like things revolving around your ship that'll kill um, enemies before they touch you. It's actually very handy. Now each world, as I mentioned, has uh, four levels. I think we're getting near the top. And of course, these uh, tricky Grim Reapers keep showing up. This right here is finally the uh, first fortress, and each of these fortresses is packed with constantly regenerating enemies. 
as well as hard to avoid traps and lots of dead ends. The goal is to find the boss that's actually hidden somewhere in the maze. While similar in layout to the Dungeons of Zelda, the Kid Icarus dungeons are actually very hard to navigate. And as you can see, some screens have quite a few enemies on them. In the fortress, you will encounter one of the most annoying video game enemies ever created, namely the Eggplant Wizard. These guys can turn you into an eggplant, which leaves you unable to fire your bow. This means you'll have to go find the hospital room, get cured, and then come all the way back and try it again. I'm positive that the eggplant wizards have caused many players to throw their joypads at the TV in disgust. Here is the first boss right here. And throughout the fortress you actually use your uh, hammers to uh, smash statues and get little helpers that will assist you in defeating the bosses. These bosses are not really that tough, but they have a lot of hit points and take a long time to defeat. Um, and definitely the bosses in Icarix are not quite uh, Castlevania or Zelda quality. Now I mentioned that Kid Icarus was actually based on Metroid and was in fact designed by the late Gunpei Yokoi and his protege Satoru Okada. In fact, after Yokoi left Nintendo, Okada continued his work in portable gaming and is pretty much the man behind the Game Boy Advance and the Nintendo DS. Now all that being said, Icarus is not really a Metroid clone. Unlike Metroid, Kid Icarus is completely linear and doesn't really contain any hidden items or secrets or anything like that. At first, this might seem like a step backwards, but it is really only uh, proves that Yokoi and Nintendo weren't really locked into one particular gameplay style. Kid Icarus stitches the exploration and instead focuses on sheer difficulty of not getting killed. You are almost always in constant danger of falling to your death, and in the fortress levels you are frequently bombarded by more enemies you can easily handle. We actually sort of have a little cameo here from the Metroids themselves. And, you know, in many ways, Kid Icarus actually gets easier the further you get into the game. As your life bar increases and your weapons improve, regular levels become much less stressful and actually the game becomes pretty fun. Probably the most striking thing about the Kid Icarus level design is that the game is almost completely vertical. You start by climbing out of the uh, dark chambers of the underworld to the surface and then up to the heavens as we are here, which are decorated with all these sort of Greco-Roman style columns and statues. And again, plenty of places to fall to your death. The final level is a substantial change of pace. It's actually a, a less than spectacular horizontal shoot 'em up, followed by the main boss, Medusa herself. As with Metroid, the game has multiple endings depending on your stats when you finish the game. This final level is a bit disappointing, but at least Medusa herself is reasonably cool looking. And as folks who have played Zelda know, whenever you have an enemy that has a big ol' eye like this, you always gotta shoot him right in the eye to kill him. Well, Kid Icarus was pretty well received, but never actually became the reoccurring franchise uh, like Metroid, Mario, and Zelda did. Maybe this is because Kid Icarus never really scales the same heights as those games. Kid Icarus is a flawed game, but uh, don't get me wrong, it's still one of the best games of 1986, and stands head and shoulders above most of the platforming competition, such as Wing of Medulla from last episode. I'd say it's actually certainly more enjoyable than the other game from Nintendo we'll be looking at, um, which is actually the last game we'll be seeing this episode. So I'm going to go ahead and say that Kid Icarus is the best game of Crontendo episode 14, and if you've never played it, by all means, give it a try just be prepared to actually have quite a struggle getting through the first uh, couple levels. After you get past those, uh, as long as you kill lots of enemies and get lots of points, you'll uh, do pretty well. Our next title is also an FDS title, and Kid of Princess is another game from Imagineer and Wavejack, the same team that brought you the rather unusual shooter RPG hybrid, Jenga Densho. 
Kiana Princess means kidnap princess, I think, and I believe that is what this game is about. One might be tempted to look at that title screen and think that Kiana Princess is one of those charming and underappreciated Japan-only titles, but unfortunately, no. Due to the amount of Japanese involved, it would be impossible for a non-Japanese speaker to really play this game, but I very seriously doubt it's any good in any language. This game seems vaguely Zelda-esque. Here is one of the action sequences where your character navigates a rather typical ladders and platform setup. Though seemingly unarmed, you are able to defend yourself by shooting projectiles at the bears which roam the halls. What's going on here? Where are you? Why are these bears running around trying to kill you? Boy, I, I really don't know. One strange thing about this game is just like Ding Jenga Denshu, it really doesn't seem to resemble exactly any previous games, even though it might remind you of some earlier games. But playing this, it's really hard to find an exact example of a game that's just like this. Now one thing you should know, it's very difficult to successfully execute a jump in this level. The springboard there is virtually impossible to use correctly, and simply jumping up from one level to the next is way more difficult than it should be. Believe it or not, you actually can jump up one level like I'm trying to do here, but it's so difficult to actually pull off. It took me a uh, rather unusual number of time to actually find a way to jump up one level in this game. Now the game also contains some overworld sequences, well as we see right here. Here, you know, as you can imagine, you simply run around and interact with the various townspeople. Uh, you can amusingly even kill townspeople, though I'm not really sure what effect this has on the game. And typically you can buy items with the yen that you've collected, save your games, and hopefully find clues about the missing princess. Oh, another thing that's kind of strange, there seems to be a clock in the lower right hand corner that's actually running in real time. That is actually, uh, oops, I just killed a guy there, and he turns into a little ghost. I'm not sure what the purpose of that clock is, but it does actually sort of count off the minutes in real time. So what exactly all these different elements add up to, I'm really not sure. This is clearly a sort of Zelda-esque action-adventure game with some puzzles of some sort in it, but uh, beyond that, it's really hard to make much sense of this. Hey, this game actually has some pretty decent music. From DBSoft, it is Layla, a science fiction themed side scroller. Sort of a run and gun type title. DBSoft was not the most prolific developer for the Famicom. The last game we saw from them was Galg, back in December of 1985. Galg, as you might recall, was that sort of RPG esque uh, shoot em up title. They seem to like science fiction themes, and Layla is no exception. It's sort of like a low rent version of Metroid. You play this well armed young woman who seems to have the job of clearing out these asteroids of any form of alien life. However, unlike the rather business like Samus Aran, Layla has a sweet tooth and finds time to gobble down slices of cake and ice cream cones in between blasting creatures and collecting ammunition. Occasionally, she'll even pick up a pair of roller skates. So Layla is definitely not your typical space hunter girl. One thing this game does have is lots of ammo. I'll try to blow up some of those crates with a grenade. Ah, there are some roller skates as I mentioned. You often have to use your uh, blaster to shoot through uh, things blocking your way. Now one weird thing about this game is 
The character is absurdly loaded down with weapons. You find pistols, rocket launchers, flamethrowers, grenades, swords, and axes, all kinds of things. Layla is really sort of a predecessor to the titles like Doom, where you walk around with an entire arsenal strapped on your back. And if you think about it, most games at this time didn't let you collect a lot of weapons, usually two at most. Think of Commando, Castlevania, those sorts of things. Shoot 'em ups were starting to have lots of special weapons, but selecting a new one would usually cause the old one to disappear, for example in games like Xanic. Not so with Layla, where you can collect weapons and ammunition to your heart's content. We are now in sort of one of these little sort of warehouse-like areas. Layla doesn't really have levels, so to speak. Each asteroid contains a number of different sections. Some are long, some are short, and you simply go across them until you come to the elevator. I like the fact that this is booby-trapped with these uh, gigantic 30-ton weights here. Uh, you can see all the different weapons that you have. It's like a throwing dagger right there. DBSoft tended to make these unique, if not great, games. We'll think of Galg, for example. And Layla is actually pretty good. All those different elements add a sense of fun. You can sort of explore around and see what different weapons do. Uh, the actual execution isn't really that exciting. Um, the game does suffer from repetition in the levels. You tend to move through a bunch of almost identical caves and these futuristic warehouse-like levels. Also sort of annoying, when your life gets low, the screen starts flashing red. Uh, this makes it kind of difficult to concentrate on what you're doing. For the most part though, the game controls well, even though the floors seem a little bit too slippery. Often it's sometimes pretty difficult to shoot blocks or walls that are right at head level. Apparently this is what I came in here looking for. Not sure what exactly that is, but it's obviously the object that you need to find at the end of every level. Oh yes, and there's also a boss coming up. The bosses seem reasonably well designed, if not exceptional. Though I suppose that picture of the guy in the background has something to do with the plot of the story. In between levels, you'll find these little bonus stages, uh, where you fly around on your space bike, and it's sort of like a little mini shoot 'em up You actually can't get killed, you simply uh, shoot aliens for points. If you shoot all of them in a row, you get uh, more and more points. So Layla is a fun, playable little title that goes a little bit beyond your typical formulaic side-scroller. I'd say it's definitely worth checking out. It's really too bad that DBSoft didn't make more games for the Famicom, because just like Sunsoft, they seem to be sort of improving in quality. As it stands, I think the uh, company stopped making games sometime in the uh, 1980s. Ugh, speaking of sci-fi games, here's one I don't like. Cosmo Genesis has a catchy musical theme and a pretty wicked logo on the title screen, but that just sets your expectations too high. It even has a nice little introduction where it shows your guy getting into the ship. Seems like the old hop into the ship and blast off into outer space intro would become standard for shoot 'em ups in later years. Uh, not so much 1996, however. It's a nice little touch. Of course, once the game itself actually starts, you'll find it's just another clone of Star Raiders, the old Atari game. 
Namco had already released the Star Raiders clone for the Famicom, called Star Luster, back in 1985. Namco's game was decent, but certainly not exceptional. Cosmo Genesis, on the other hand, is simply a pain in the ass to play. You might be familiar with this title because it was released in the US as Star Voyager in 1987, and had the distinction of being one of the very first games released by the notorious Acclaim for the Nintendo. For those who don't recall Star Raiders, that is very simple. Look at the uh, radar screen, warp to the enemy's location, and then destroy all the ships in that sector. You can refuel and repair your ships at the various space stations. The enemy ships will be busy trying to blow up your home base or something, so you need to really get cracking. This right here is actually what it looks like to dock with a space station. Um, as is tip for, the, for these kind of games, it's usually kind of a slow and tedious process. I actually don't need to dock to the space station because uh, I'm still pretty much with quite a bit of fuel. That's, uh, well, there's two fuel gauges. There's one in the upper right hand corner and then one along the right hand side. I believe the one in the upper right hand corner represents like actual fuel tanks or something. One thing you might notice about this game is while well, it does have opening music, the game itself doesn't really have any music at all. Just some rather lame little sound effects. So what's wrong with this game? Well, first of all, for example, take warping. Okay, you go ahead and use the D-pad to move your cursor around to where you want to go to. Those little X's represent enemy ships. But then it's unnecessarily complicated. You need to accelerate all the way, or almost all the way, and then hold down the button for the correct number of cells to appear on the upper left based on how far the trip is. In this case, it's nine units, whatever that is. Once you get up to nine cells, then you need to release the button, and you'll start warping. Then once you get really close to where you're going, hold down the button again, and you'll exit uh, hyperspace, or wherever you are. And sometimes you can actually not end up in the right location because you can get blown off course. Apparently some sectors have high solar winds or something like that. And the fact that you have to do all this stuff simply to warp around from one area to another doesn't really make the game any more realistic or deep or anything. It basically just uh, makes it one more thing you have to do. Okay, I'm in the right spot and there's enemy ships approaching. As your little message thing says there, it actually takes them quite a while to actually appear. I guess you sort of have to fly around and find them. However, the combat is actually pretty painful. The enemy ships fly around very fast. And the animation is pretty jerky. So I really can't always tell what's going on. Once we actually find some ships, I'm sure you'll see what I'm talking about. Warping uses up a lot of fuel, and getting hit really sucks around a, a huge amount of fuel. So you'll end up having to go back and dock at space stations quite frequently. I usually get killed pretty quickly upon engaging enemies. There are a few new elements to this game. For example, you can activate shields, which turn space green. And you can find power-ups on the various planets found throughout the solar system. Of course, this will not compensate for the fact that most of the game is pretty horrible. Maybe that's why Acclaim wanted to release this game. They felt it was somehow tied into their own video game standards. As you can see, actually, well, I guess I've pretty much been killed already. So yeah, this is def definitely one that you'll probably want to stay well away from. It's uh, really not nearly as good as some of the games that ASCII has already released for the Famicom. Family Trainer Running Stadium is the second in Bandai's Family Trainer series. We covered the first game, Athletic World, just a few episodes ago. The Family Trainer Pad is the Japanese equivalent of the US Power Pad, and just like in that first game, you run on the pad in order to make your character move. This first event here is just a very simple uh, two-person sprint. However, Family Trainer is much more notorious due to the game's release history, rather than the game itself. 
The first US release was by Bandai themselves under the name Stadium Events. This version was only sold in some regional Woolworth stores and for a very brief time. As a result, the Bandai Stadium Events is the rarest of all the officially released Nintendo Entertainment System titles, and copies go for outrageous amounts of money whenever they surface. The reason why Stadium Events was on the market for such a short period of time was that Nintendo had just bought the US rights to the Family Trainer Pad and this game. Nintendo eventually released the Power Pad in the US, and Stadium Events was retitled and given a wide release under the name World Class Track Meet. The Nintendo version, just like the original Japanese version, is a pretty easy title to find. Now as for the game itself, well, it's essentially a first-person version of Konami's track and field, with racing, jumping, and hurdle competitions. Now the Family Trainer games were actually developed by the company Human, and they actually do a really nice job with the pseudo 3D effects, and there are some very nice details. For example, look at all the little shadows and everything in this event. So, Running Stadium is a nicely done up Family Trainer Power Pad game that has ended up being completely overshadowed by the collectability of one of the release variants. But as a Power Pad game, it actually works pretty well. Released on Christmas Eve is Capcom's Tatakai no Banka, which might be translated as War Requiem. In the US, this game was known as Trojan. Never heard of the game? Well, that's not surprising, since it really didn't do as nearly as well as other Capcom titles released around this time, such as Ghosts and Goblins or Commando. Released in arcades in 1986, Trojan is a side-scrolling proto-beat-em-up. This game takes place in a post-apocalyptic New York. Armed with a sword and shield, you take on an endless tide of bad guys. Here's the Famicom version, ported by Capcom themselves. It actually looks okay. Plays pretty similarly to the arcade version. Mostly you just walk to the right and kill guys with your sword. Dropping down the manhole will actually allow you to fight this guy and then score a pair of high jump boots. Unfortunately, they can only be used around three times before they wear off. Well, actually, I guess it would be four times, so you have to use them once to actually get out of the manhole. You can then use them to take out the little guys that hide up in the windows there and throw a dynamite at you. Each level will usually have about a couple bosses, and then you're off to the next level. Those guys are still pretty hard to hit. Oops, now my, my jump boots are gone. These first guys are pretty easy. Just whack them with a sword. Trojan will probably remind you a lot of ghosts and goblins, right down to the map at the beginning of each level. Unfortunately, this game seems more or less like an unsuccessful attempt to make a second game in the ghosts and goblins mold. But Trojan is simply not as fun as ghosts and goblins. It's actually frustratingly hard at times, and sort of lacks the kind of personality that Ghosts and Goblins had. We'll be coming up to the next boss here in just a second, and he's actually quite a bit tougher. He can block your hits, and will fire a projectile at you. The projectile can hit you either high or low, and will often turn around and hit you in the back after it's past you. He sometimes fires short projectiles, and sometimes uh, long ones. The short ones will hit you immediately and you have to get pretty close to him to hit him with your sword, and so he can blast you at point blank. Now we're on to the next level here. Uh, the main problem with this game, though, is the control scheme. One button's used to swing your sword, the other one to hold up your shield. This means that in order to jump, you need to press up on the D-pad. Considering they have to do a lot of jumping, especially with the bosses, this makes your character pretty difficult to control. If they had stuck with the uh, classic Ghost and Goblins control scheme for attacking and jumping, Trojan might have been a pretty cool little game. As it stands, however, Trojan War remain a little-known game surrounded by much better releases from Capcom. Released on Christmas Day, it's Seikima 2, and what a wonderful Christmas present for the people of Japan. 
Your first thought might be, Seikima 2? What about Seikima 1? Well, no, Seikima 2 is the name of a Japanese rock band who dressed in ridiculous kiss-like outfits and makeup. The name is actually a sort of pun, since Seikimatsu means end of the century in Japanese. The band apparently had some sort of backstory about being demons who were announcing the end of the world or something like that. But hell, games like this? This is why we're actually playing every single Famicom game. What could be more delightful than discovering a game based on some obscure old 1980s Japanese kiss ripoff? Of course, that's not to say this is a good game. Far from it. It's a pretty irritating platformer in which you need to collect every object on the screen, which include ghosts and apparently band member heads, in order to uh, move on to the next level. One odd thing, I'm sure that Konami had nothing at all to do with this, yet Seikima 2 seems to borrow the sprite of the holy water from Castlevania, as well as the Moe heads, uh, they make an appearance as an indestructible enemy. The actual developer of this game was ISCO, which means Intelligent System Corporation. You probably haven't heard of them, they're a reasonably obscure Japanese contract developer, and I think this was one of their first games. They continued to develop games until at least the late 1990s. I think they might still be around, but really not as a video game company. Perhaps more noteworthy is that this is the first Famicom game from CBS Sony. Now, Sony had already been releasing games for the MSX computers, which makes sense because they actually manufactured MSX computers. But this was really their first foray into the Japanese home console market. Obviously, they would eventually become Nintendo's biggest rival in that department. But of course, no one could have possibly guessed that looking by this game. Alright, here we are in the second level. Oddly enough, all the money bags you collect actually uh, have dollar signs rather than yen signs. And throughout the game you do accrue funds, and you can spend them in shops. Uh, one thing that sort of gets a little bit irritating about this game is when you get low on health, this incredibly annoying little uh, bleeping noise starts to let you know. You can actually take quite a few hits. But you will get hit quite a few times simply because of the number of enemies that simply drop down from the top of the screen onto you, and the fact that your character has a really weird jumping motion. Here's the shop screen. Um, one thing you need to buy are the guitars. Once you get all of them for all your band members, uh, you actually get the ending of the game. So no, this is definitely not a good game. Uh, it's perhaps worth taking a look at just for the weird novelty value. But uh, this is pretty indicative of the kind of very sort of minor, uh, not very well designed platformers that were being released for the Famicom at this time and would continue to be released for a while. Alright, we fired up the FDS here for another Mahjong game. This is Professional Mahjong Goku, as a matter of fact. This title was released by ASCII, but as you may have seen on the title screen there, it was actually developed by a company called Chat Noir. They're a rather obscure little Japanese development company that seems to specialize in Mahjong games. Mahjong, as I'm sure you know, is quite popular in Japan, and this is actually the third Mahjong game released for the Famicom. Which is really not that many. Altogether, there would be over a dozen Mahjong titles released for the Famicom during its lifespan. And this one looks, well, to my eyes, pretty much like all the rest. I don't really play Mahjong, and uh, I don't really know how to judge whether this is a good game or not. Now remember, this is called Professional Mahjong Goku, so there's got to be some sort of additional element in it, and there's actually a few different gameplay modes. This one seems to be the standard, but uh, there is a mode where you can actually gamble. I guess you have some settings here you have set up before you can actually play. And then once the game starts, it allows you to apparently place bets, and uh, it's actually a four-person Mahjong game for this mode right here. Mahjong is, of course, a, a form of gambling, and it's normally played for money.
Well, beyond that, I really don't have much to say about this game. Um, I suppose that this is uh, simply notable for being uh, one of the uh, earlier Mahjong games on the system. We'll be seeing plenty more of these. Last episode, we reviewed Nazo no Kaba, aka Crackout, Konami's Arkanoid inspired game. And in this episode, we have a home version of Arkanoid itself, released on the Famicom a mere 13 days after Nazo no Kaba. Funny how that works sometimes. As we mentioned last episode, Arkanoid was a 1986 arcade hit from Taito, which updated the formula of the old Atari game Breakout. Due to the huge success of the arcade game, it was quickly ported to the MSX and the Famicom in Japan, and then eventually to pretty much every home computer system known to man. Arkanoid's primary additions to the old breakout formula are the addition of various power-ups that drop down occasionally, and the much more complicated block patterns. This Famicom version is pretty faithful to the arcade game. It looks virtually identical. The one main subtraction is the fact that you don't have that cool sort of animated intro during the, uh, the uh, title screen there. Now the various power-ups will do things like uh, slow down the speed of the ball, as we see here. There's a dark blue one that'll actually make your ship longer, making it easier to hit the ball. Another one will give you multiple balls in the air at one time, and so on and so forth. There's also these enemies that will now float down from the ceiling, Occasionally you'll have to hit those. And there's even a final level that consists of a boss character which takes multiple hits to destroy. The home versions of Arkanoid, both in the US and Japan, were released with a special rotary knob Arkanoid controller. This makes the game a lot more enjoyable to play, as it's really difficult to accurately control your ship using the standard joypad. Another addition to the old breakout formula, some blocks will take multiple hits to destroy, and a lot of levels have indestructible blocks. For example, the gold ones we see right here. This is the second to last level before meeting the boss himself. The levels are not nearly as complicated as the Konami game, but uh, still, Arkanoid is a lot of fun to play. Especially if you have the Arkanoid controller. Oddly enough, this boss looks like something that belongs in a Konami game. Arkanoid actually has some sort of plot, and after defeating the boss, you'll get sort of a story wrap-up, which doesn't really make any sense. Uh, maybe it's badly trapped, translated from the Japanese. So we'll say Arkanoid, yeah, it's a pretty good arcade game that was made into a pretty accurate home conversion. Definitely worth playing, especially if you have the Arkanoid controller. Without that, you might find the game a bit challenging. One thing about Chemco, they are nothing if not unpredictable. They managed to release two games on December 26th, and the first one we'll take a look at is Electrician. This is actually a pretty good uh, title screen here. Chemco's past releases had been all over the place, but they were mostly junk. Electrician is a surprisingly fun old school game, but it was a real out of left field release. It's a port of a pretty obscure game from Synapse Software originally for the Atari computers back in 1984. I have no idea what made Chemco decide to port the electrician to the Famicom, but it turned out to be a reasonably good idea. And yes, this is a Famicom disk system release. Remember, of course, that these were actually cheaper to make than cartridges. So you can actually save your game, which seems a little weird for this kind of game. Electrician starts with New York City suddenly suffering massive damage to its electrical infrastructure, plunging the entire city into darkness. In real life, this would probably result in a state of emergency being declared. But in this game, they decided to send out a single electrician to rewire every building one at a time. And that electrician is you. you use one button to lay down the wire to each room, and the other button to jump. 
need to connect both rooms entirely by wire. There's usually uh, nodes at the top and nodes at the bottom. Once you've got one room wired, blam, it lights up. Along the way, you'll encounter various wire-eating vermin, such as caterpillars, rats, and surprisingly large spiders. There's also a difficulty setting on here, the speed. I have it at low. Setting it at high will make the game much more challenging, almost impossibly so. The levels are not too large, usually less than half a dozen rooms tall. Occasionally lighting up a room will let, uh, release a burglar, and if any of the vermin actually cross a live wire, represented by yellow wires as opposed to green, they will get zapped. Now for some reason, you utilize the maze-like sewer systems in order to travel from one building to the next. Every other level is one of these underground levels. We have the first one here. For some reason, they decide to place walls randomly in the sewer tunnels, making it more difficult to get around. Now, Synep Software was an American game developer that began making games for the Atari systems in the early 1980s. By 1984, they had fallen on hard times due to the video game crash, and were acquired by Broderbund. Shortly thereafter, they disappeared for good. Broderbund had already been licensing games such as Load Runner to Japanese publishers, Presumably, Kimco wanted another game on the market for the holiday season, and they got a really good deal on this one. Admittedly, this game is not fantastic, but it's a lot better than earlier titles like Doughboy. One huge failing in the game, however, is the rather difficult jumping controls. Avoiding enemies is not that tough, but jumping across the gaps are, and I've plummeted to my death many times on this thing. So, all in all, how do we feel about Electrician? Well, like I mentioned, it's definitely not a great game, but it is sort of charming in an old-fashioned kind of way. This is a style of game that was really sort of disappearing uh, as the Famicom saw more and more modern-style platform games. I have no idea who actually did this port to the Famicom. I don't think Kimiko themselves did it, but it is surprisingly well done. December 26 saw the release of two games packaged with special controllers, Arkanoid and Crazy Climber. This is a port of the old, but very awesome, 1980 Nichibutsu arcade game. Nichibutsu had already released Famicom versions of their other titles, such as Terra Cresta, but Crazy Climber was perhaps their defining moment. The game is clearly inspired by the human fly craze of the late 70s, most notably George Willig climbing the World Trade Center in 1977. The arcade game had a rather unique two-joystick control system, one for each hand, and this made a rather simple concept a lot of fun, and thus uh, the release of uh, this game for the Famicom in Japan only was packaged with a special Crazy Climber controller. For those of you not familiar with the actual game, basically you simply climb up the uh, side of this very tall building, watching out people dropping objects on you, windows closing, and later things like giant gorillas. Now unfortunately, playing this without the special controller is not really an option. If you use emulation, you can probably rig something up, but the game is not really going to be a lot of fun without the correct set of controllers. Probably the best way to experience Crazy Climber, other than owning an original arcade version, is to uh, plug a double joystick system into MAME. This game starts off with some crazy Suspiria-like music, and it's the last game we'll be looking at for in the year 1986, Toki no Tabito. And check out those crazy hot pink gloves. Word of advice, it's hard to look badass wearing gloves like that. 
Now this game is a Famicom original, and it's based on an animated movie of the same name, which came out in 1986. Judging by the poster, I don't think the movie resembles the video game very much. Just like Electrician, it's not really clear who developed this game, whether or not it was Kimco or someone else. Regardless, Time Stranger will probably be of little interest to a non-Japanese speaker. This is more or less a text adventure game, but it's not very complicated, certainly nothing along the lines of Portopia. The gameplay simply consists of talking to various figures from Japanese history, such as uh, Oda Nobunaga or General Tojo. Your character is some kind of time cop who mostly travels forward in Japanese history and stops at various important events, such as the Ikadaya Affair or the Battle of Sikigahara. This game occasionally has little third-person scenes, such as this one right here, but there's really not that much to them. There's really no action in this game. You do have to stand underneath your uh, spaceship's beam in order to get sucked back up into the spaceship, otherwise the game ends. Com but compared to most adventure games, this game is pretty simple. You're limited strictly to yes or no answers, uh, which is what you uh, see right there, those two boxes with a little pink dot that goes back and forth. Compared to something like Partopia, there's really not that much to it. Um, you can't really like walk around, find objects, only talk to one person at any given time. The game is pretty simple uh, as compared to most adventure games. Oh, here's Tojo here. He has that funny little uh, frame picture of Adolf Hitler on his mantle place there. The one unusual thing about this game is it actually has sort of branching paths. Depending on what answers you give, the game will actually give you a different ending. This is unusual, of course, and might give the game replay value, but it still seems like a relatively short, simple game. And with that, we have wrapped up 1986. Now let's move on to the grand year of 1987. Wow, so we're finally done with 1986 and into 1987, which is the fifth year of the Famicom's existence. Normally Japanese video game publishers seem to slow down after the holiday season, but at this point the Famicom was so popular, they just kept releasing games, even in early January. 1986 was a pretty monumental year for the system, and we'll have to do a wrap-up of the year at some point in the near future, really not enough time this episode, and 1987 will turn out to be just as notable. So let's start with the games. Nineteen eighty seven opens with a new game from Konami. Hooray! But this game isn't really that great. In fact, it's based on a licensed property, and maybe doesn't really have the typical Konami attention to detail. Still, it is an interesting title. Hino Tori Ho Ohin is based on a serialized manga from Uzama Tezuka that originally ran in nineteen sixty nine and nineteen seventy. Tezuka was a prolific writer and artist, and probably the most important and influential figure in manga history. Certainly his most well-known creation is Astro Boy. The original comic took place in 8th century Japan and concerns a wandering one-armed bandit. Not coincidentally, there was an animated feature released in 1986. This episode is only one story from the Hinotori series that was released over a period of 20 years. Not surprisingly, this game doesn't really follow the original plot, but is simply a scrolling platformer, sort of in the Castlevania mold. Your character, Gao, travels through various lands and encounters all sorts of enemies. Aside from firing a projectile, his main talent is the ability to generate a little block, which can be used as a step. This seems very similar to Solomon no Kegi. Hitting an enemy will cause him to turn into a block, uh, which you can then collect as long as it's still in motion because at any given time you have a limited number of blocks, as shown in the counter up at the top of the screen there. Just like Castlevania, you face a different boss at the end of each level. This first guy here is really not that hard to defeat, as long as you create a little staircase in order to reach him. I'm not sure exactly what he's supposed to be, but he is reasonably cool looking.
and these boss battles will probably mind you quite a bit of Castlevania. After defeating the boss, you receive a piece of a painting of the Hinotori. Um, incidentally, Hinotori is usually translated into Phoenix in English, and that's what the painting is of. Now, while Castlevania was pretty straightforward, Hinotori does get a little trickier as the game progresses. In order to finish it, you need to find hidden levels by uncovering hidden doors. So this game is sort of like Castlevania uh, crossed with elements of King Kong 2. Not that I've ever been able to finish it. The game does look pretty good, has sort of a limited color scheme as was uh, typical. The game does look an awful lot like Castlevania, with sort of the, uh, you know, kind of weird shadows and uh, backgrounds and whatnot. I assume that Konami developed this game themselves, even though this doesn't really quite seem like a uh, grade A Konami project. Okay, here is the second boss. He's some sort of rock kind of guy. Maybe a little trickier than the first one, but probably still nothing you can't deal with. And the bosses here are pretty nice looking, as you can see. All in all, this is pretty a, pretty much a solid game. Uh, definitely not the best Konami has ever done. The main selling point to Japanese audiences is undoubtedly the manga anime tie-in, but you'll probably find something to enjoy here. So while this game does sort of have a uh, treading water kind of feel to it, Konami was definitely had other things in mind. In fact, we're going to see a game from them next episode that is completely different than anything they've released so far. Namco decides to usher in the new year by dusting off an old arcade game and porting it to the Famicom. Yep, it's Dragon Buster, a port of Namco's 1984 arcade game. Not very well known, at least in the US, the arcade Dragon Buster was a little ahead of its time, and was pretty impressive upon release. Dragon Buster was an early side-scroller, just like Pac-Land, and actually used the Pac-Land hardware. It was one of the first games to use a health meter, as you notice the vitality bar in the corner there, instead of regular lives, and had a fantasy theme back before this is common in video games. It also used an overworld-style map between levels. As you can see here, much of the game involves busting dragons. Here's the Famicom release. The actual object of the game is to make your way through various caves and mountains, towers, etc. Each level has sub-bosses to defeat, like that little dinosaur-type thing we just killed there. And uh, after killing a boss, you'll receive some sort of helpful item, usually a one-time use spell. And there we have a wizard with another helpful spell. After getting through each level, you'll be transported to the overworld. And these screens allow you to select your path to the castle, making this an example of a very basic non-linearity in games. You can see this in action right here. You're armed primarily with a sword, with which you can do several attacks. For example, you can jump over someone and do a downward thrust, and you can also cast spells to do damage to an enemy. We're on the castle, and here is the first dragon boss, definitely the toughest boss in the game, since his fire attack makes it difficult to actually get close enough to hit him. I just cast a fire spell on him there. Round one's clear, and we're off to the next level, which is simply slightly larger and has more branching paths. Now, while Dragon Buster was an innovative and underappreciated game in its time, it doesn't really hold up that well today. The game is pretty repetitive, and while the arcade version holds a certain appeal due to the nice graphics and decent sound, this FC port looks awfully plain. There is a certain amount of climbing and jumping in the game, like you saw a second ago, but you wouldn't really call this a platformer. 
it's mostly just walk, 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 then fight a boss. And the fact that you get more or less the same four bosses over and over again does make the game a little dull after a while. Some levels, like as you get later on in the game, get a bit more complicated, but uh, still it's the game is sort of the same thing over and over again. So unfortunately, Dragon Buster is a good example of a fine game that became obsolete by the better games that followed in its wake. Ghosts and Goblins came out just a year later, but is massively more playable by today's standards. Episode 14 is winding down, and we have one really big game to cover, but first, we have to do Labyrinth. Published by Takuma Shoten, the monstrous Japanese publishing and entertainment company. As the uh, credits scroll here, note the Activision copyright. We'll discuss that a little later. Labyrinth is of course based on the popular Jim Henson George Lucas movie, starring Jennifer Connelly and David Bowie as the Goblin King who doesn't really look like a goblin. Just like in the movie, Sarah's brother has been kidnapped and must be rescued in 13 hours. By the way, this game was only released in Japan, and we were playing an unofficial English translation. Of course, your character in this game doesn't really resemble Jennifer Connelly, but has rather been transformed into a typical Japanese super-deformed girl who looks to still be around grade school age. Now, Labyrinth is a rather large, ambitious action-adventure game, taking place in a series of interconnected maze-like levels, which makes sense because the game is about a labyrinth after all, and it sort of resembles, well, King Kong 2, perhaps. I just grabbed a necklace, which will grab me some money, and then there's the hearts. You can apply the hearts to one of your uh, companions, get enough hearts and they'll appear in the game with you and assist you. Your character can't die in the normal sense, but can run out of time. You can see the timer in the upper right hand corner there. Getting hit will cause you to lose a few minutes. If it reaches zero, the game is over. You need to collect a series of keys, but there are other items as well, such as books that will restore some time, hearts that can be given to your companions, the necklaces which are uh, money which can be used in shops, and so on and so forth. The main challenge of the game is to find your way around the various levels which are mostly pretty tricky to navigate. However, once you've mapped the game out, well, I got some sort of little scroll there that gave me, I guess, about an hour or so worth of time. Once you've figured a way around uh, the game, it's actually really not that difficult. Regardless, you do have sort of a constant stream of enemies coming out at you uh, and attacking, which can get pretty irritating. Now, I mentioned Activision is listed in the credits, which raises the question, who developed this game? Uh, some game sites list Activision as the developer, but they were the publisher of another Labyrinth game, the one developed by LucasArts for American computers such as the Apple II and the Commodore 64. Both games are based on the movie, but they are otherwise completely different games. I assume Takuma Shoten had to license the game rights from Activision. Intriguingly, in one of the levels, the word Atlas is spelled out in the background. Which makes you wonder, is this an early Atlas game? They seem to specialize in fantasy and RPG games, so Labyrinth is certainly consistent with their style. Well, no matter who developed Labyrinth, it is a solid attempt at making a big Zelda-like adventure game, but is let down by the gameplay and lack of variety of the levels. And speaking of disappointments, let's move on to the last game this episode. Our last game this episode is a huge one, Zelda II, The Adventures of Link. The first Zelda game, released in February of 1986, was an enormous hit in Japan, and 11 months later, Nintendo has put out a sequel on the FDS. Though what we're looking at here is actually the western version. This is a pretty nice little intro, and we're eventually given a title scroll detailing the plot, though the manual itself tells a slightly different story. 
Rather than Zelda herself being under a sleeping spell, it was actually some distant ancestor, also named Zelda, who was put under a Sleeping Beauty style curse many years ago. As a result, Link has to find the Triforce of Courage, apparently a different Triforce, Triforce number 3, according to the title scroll, than the one found in the first game, to awaken her. Not sure what happened to Triforce number 2. Now Nintendo is known for making some odd sequels, and Zelda 2 is no exception. It's often called the Black Sheep of the Zelda family. It's quite a bit different than its predecessor, and not nearly as popular, though of course it still sold several million copies. The basic idea is the same, you move around on an overworld, enter dungeons, or palaces in this game, defeat bosses, and then repeat. The most obvious difference is that all the battle sequences are now from a more standard side view perspective, and scrolling is used in the game. Also, while Zelda 2 is not really an RPG, it does borrow a number of elements from the genre. This shouldn't really be surprising, Japan was becoming very fascinated with RPGs, and virtually every game genre, from platformers to shoot 'em ups, were adding in RPG elements. With Zelda, this means enemies are appearing randomly on the overworld, which, uh, let's face it, looks an awful lot like it was taken straight out of Dragon Quest. Also, there are experience points and leveling up of attack, defense, and magic. That's right, Link has magic in this game, though he won't be using it that frequently. There's also a number of platform ailments, such as scenes like this. Unlike the first game, falling to your death is a common occurrence in Zelda 2. Also, taken from RPGs, there are lots of towns and NPCs to talk to, not just crazy old guys in caves. One thing about Zelda 2 is it doesn't always play by RPG rules. Some common enemies don't drop any experience points. And then there's this woman who refills your life bar when you go inside the house with her. Uh, this particular scene sort of makes you wonder exactly what they were thinking of. The NPCs give you little hints and occasionally send you on short little quests to find some objects such as a trophy or a lost child. The reward, you can usually learn a new magical spell. Uh, some of the spells are generally useful, while others have very specific purposes, such as defeating a particular boss. Uh, for example, I just uh, found this woman's trophy. Now she'll invite me in to meet her little wizard-like grandfather. These guys uh, always live in some sort of basement in the game. He's going to give us the jump spell, which is necessary to make some of the jumps in the game. It can make you jump a little bit higher. More traditionally, some items are found hidden in the palaces themselves. For example, there's a raft and a flute, and these are actually needed to make progress into uh, some areas. Another major change, Zelda 2 is much more linear. Link travels along a winding path that moves roughly from east to west. There is some backtracking required, but very little along the way of puzzles or exploration. Combat is obviously very different in Zelda 2, and I think this is a major failing in the game. Some enemies have some sort of shield and can attack both high and low, so you are constantly ducking and then standing up, trying to shield their blows and then get hit in yourself. Now here's, here's the uh, real meat of the game, the palaces. Unlike the linked rooms in Zelda 1, the palaces have these long corridors with floors connected by elevators. Keys are required to get past locked doors, and there's even some hidden passages, so you won't simply be moving in a strictly linear fashion. Still, the palaces feel very different in Zelda's dungeons. Uh, here's one of these difficult and annoying enemies right here. Remember the Dark Nuts in Zelda? You had to sneak up and hit them from behind? In Zelda 2, almost every enemy is like that. You can't just walk up and hit them. Additionally, pretty much all the enemies take multiple hits, often around 5 to 10, sometimes a whole lot more, even once you're all powered up. This makes combat kind of tiresome and repetitive. I really got tired of dealing with these guys. Those little blue things with the spikes I don't think you can destroy at all. You have, um, some special attacks that you learn throughout the game, like a jump with a, a downward sword thrust like you saw there, but they don't seem to actually work on most of the tougher enemies. Likewise, throwing your sword doesn't work on most enemies either, except for the really weak ones. 
Now that was the raft required to get to the eastern continent. Every palace will end in a boss battle. And uh, the one spell you use the most is probably the shield spell. We see this coming up right here. These are almost sort of like Castlevania-like rooms here. Many of the bosses in this game are of the sort of jump and hit them on the head variety, just like Castlevania. Castlevania seems to be sort of an influence on this game, though oddly enough, Castlevania 2 seems sort of influenced by Zelda 2. Well, I guess it's hard to say. Now, just like in Castlevania, you actually sort of get pushed back a bit when you get hit by an enemy. And this makes the platforming sections all the more difficult and really uh, a bit irritating at times. Remember those Gorgon heads that you had in Castlevania? Well, there's tons of flying enemies here. Ah, uh, here I'm using the raft to get over to the eastern continent. There's uh, some more very basic enemies there that don't take any, uh, don't get any experience points. Now these things are much like the Gorgon heads, only they take like five hits to kill. It seems that, uh, especially towards the end of the game, it's very common to, uh, as you can see there, constantly be knocked off by enemies that suddenly fly in from the other side of the screen. I think this probably provided the majority of moments when I wanted to throw my controller at the screen. This boss is a little bit different. You need to use a special reflect spell to bounce his spells back at him. That's the only way you can defeat him. One cool thing about this game is every time you defeat a boss, they do have a pretty spectacular demise, which we'll see here in just a second. Now after finishing a boss, you get a life and magic refill, and you also automatically level up one. Now incidentally, when you level up, you can only choose one attribute. Defense, which is life, your life's at level 7, a weapon, which is at 6, and magic, which is also at 6. Uh, leveling up doesn't actually increase your life or magic meter. That's done by finding heart containers and the magic containers hidden around the overworld. I've put the crystal in a little statue here. Apparently you have to do this. Uh, the game doesn't really make it clear why. And then you actually select what you want to level up here. Here I'm going for magic. Or you can hit cancel and then wait to get more points to level up something else. Of course, leveling up reduces your points down to zero. At one point you find boots that allow you to walk on water. This gives Link an additional messiah-like quality. Here we're going to get a heart container. It should be noted there isn't any uh, armor or weapons to be found in this game. No bows or boomerangs or bombs. You only have your standard sword. Um, You'll see there's also no shops as well. Here's more bad news. Invisible flying enemies. I just hit one there. You actually need to find out. There you go. I saw him there for a second. You need to find a cross in order to see them. Zelda 2 is much more difficult than its predecessor. It's certainly the most difficult game Nintendo has released so far. It makes a Kid Icarus look like a cakewalk. Though, Many of the times that you get killed, it feels sort of unfair and cheap. Like I said, you're jumping, suddenly an enemy flies out from the side of the screen and hits you. The last boss seems kind of tough, um, though the boss might be considered a bit of a cop-out, it's just Link's shadow. He appears very fast and difficult to hit, but turns out you can just stand on one side and spam him to death. Uh, sort of disappointing, I suppose. And then we find Triforce number three. Now, in the years since Zelda 2 was released, um, the game has found a lot of defenders who uh, feel it's some sort of lost classic. And the initial bad reaction was simply a knee-jerk reaction to uh, the changes made to the formula. However, playing the game now, I honestly say I don't really like this game, and much of what made Zelda great has been removed. The puzzles and the variety of items to find and weapons, the exploration, um, all that sort of stuff has been replaced with much weaker elements. Zelda 2 seems like a sort of a tedious game with a irksome repetitive combat and downright hateful platforming sequences. Princess Zelda seems pretty cheerful for someone who has been in a coma for hundreds of years and uh, how does she even know who Link is? And I guess the first Zelda really seemed 
not really like anything else that had been released on the Famicom so far, where this Zelda 2 seems pretty typical of uh, side-scrolling platformers with RPG elements, so it's not really a terrible game. Uh, it's a typical high-quality release from Nintendo in many regards, it's just that its flaws prevent it from being a fun game. And as you are probably aware, there wouldn't be another Zelda game until 1991, four years later. As it turns out, that game was slightly better received. And so that was Zelda 2, one of the most divisive games for the entire system. Either you love it, or you hate it. Or, well, I guess I fell somewhere in the middle. Ironically, next episode will begin with another sequel to a popular Japanese game, and a sequel that I feel is much more successful than Zelda 2. So definitely tune in next time for Cron 10 to episode 15.